Welcome to the Suzanne Venker Show, where you hear hard-hitting truths the culture hides. Find out more at SuzanneVenker.com. This episode of the Suzanne Venker Show is brought to you by Hair Saloon for Men. Hair Saloon isn't just a place to get a haircut. It's an honorable rebellion against the feminization of the American male. Men and women are different, and that's a good thing. So get out of your wife's salon and head on over to Hair Saloon, where the TVs are always tuned into sports and never to Oprah. Visit HairSaloon.com. They have 18 locations in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Boston, and Houston. Book online or through their mobile app. Again, that's HairSaloon.com for men against the grain. For years, Americans have been taught to believe that feminism is about equal rights for women. But in fact, that seemingly benign concept is not at all what feminism is about. My guest today explains the vast difference between what's known as first-wave feminism and mid-20th century or second-wave feminism, which is still very much alive today. She will explain how this destructive ideology has ultimately destroyed the happiness of women, men, and families. Mona Charon is a syndicated columnist who's been writing an award-winning conservative opinion column for 30 years. In 1984, Mona joined the White House staff, serving first as Nancy Reagan's speechwriter and later as associate director of the Office of Public Liaison. She spent six years as a regular commentator on CNN's Capital Gang and has served as a judge of the Pulitzer Prizes. Mona is the author of three books, Useful Idiots and Do-Gooders, both of which are New York Times bestsellers, and her most recent, Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and common sense. It is this third book that Mona and I are going to talk about today. We'll discuss where feminism and the sexual revolution went wrong, as well as the price we've paid for denying the differences between the sexes, such as family breakdown, declining female happiness, and aimlessness among men. Mona joins us now from Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, Mona. Thank you for joining us today. Suzanne, I'm so glad to be with you. I've 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 followed you for for some time and um I feel like I know you because I know so much about what you think and what you write and I've just never had the opportunity to speak with you so I'm just thrilled that you could be here with me today on this Yeah, I'm glad you can formalize it now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think you and I have much in common and certainly write about similar things. And so that's Agreed. yeah, so that's what you're for sure here to talk about today as I as I mentioned in the opening, your most recent book called Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense, is a, just a wonderful book. It was out last year, Thank I believe, you. right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And uh, you made some media rounds in, in, in preparation for this. I watched you on the Washington Journal, or C-SPAN, I guess it is, and a couple of other uh-huh. places. Yeah. Um, which I always find is so interesting to... You know, having been in that boat myself, to go into the mainstream and discuss feminism is always a little trickier than talking about it, I don't know, in other circles or maybe even through the writing, because there's so much to say. And you have little time, well, except for that C-SPAN one was rather long, but you typically on TV, as you know, you just get a few minutes and it's just not enough time to, to delve into these oh, very, agreed. very big issues. Okay, so we're going to get right to it as fast as we can so that we don't waste any time because I've got lots to cover. Um, I wanted to start out by, by saying that basically I, I think feminism is assumed by many people to be an ideology or a worldview, if you will, that's very pro-woman. And I wanted you to explain Correct. why this is absolutely not the case. Right. So um, one of the things that people always say is, you know, how can you be a successful, professional woman who's got a family, seems to have it all, um, and yet you say you're not a feminist? I mean, that seems like a contradiction. And I say, well, it depends what you mean by feminist. <laughs> A lot of people think the word means that you believe in equality of the sexes, that you believe that women should be treated equally before the law, um, and so on. And, of course, if that's the definition, I think uh, I definitely would happily sign on to being a feminist if that's what it meant. But, of course, it means a lot more than that. It's accumulated terrible baggage in its uh, 60, 70-year career, and um, and. So one of the reasons that I wanted to write this book is to show that feminism as an idea of equality is just fine and great. We can all agree on it. But feminism, as it has actually evolved, has not 
uh, has has been really against the interests of women. It has um, it's made some critical mistakes. Uh, I don't say that everything feminism did was bad. Some of the things they did were good, but many many mistakes have led to more female unhappiness, more unhappiness by men and particularly by children um, than than uh, would have been the case without it. Um, no question about that, and that's uh, one. Of course, study that you and I both know of is the paradox of declining female happiness, and that's off. That's that when right. that came out, you can talk about that if you will. That that leads what you were just saying leads right into that. T- tell people about what that yeah. paper was about. So, so, so the um, there have been really quite a number of studies, more than one, uh, half a dozen, uh, that have been conducted not just in the United States but in all of the developed world, and that have found that women are less, over the last 50 years, women have become progressively less happy. Um, Not only have they become less happy than men, whereas they used to be happier than men on average, um, but they've become less happy than their mothers or grandmothers were at similar stages of life. Now, um, people say that this is a paradox. It's frequently presented in the media as like, how can this be so with all of the advances of feminism, right? Women have achieved so much and the work for, workplace and so on and so forth. And, um, and, you know, one has to be careful with over-interpreting data like this. It's pretty complicated what goes into uh, making people happy or unhappy. But I, pre- I present these data and I um, speculate that one of the reasons that women are less happy than they used to be is because among the changes that have happened in the last 50 years have made women much less secure than they used to be. And women really value security for obvious reasons. We need security. We're the ones who get pregnant. We're the ones who take care of children. We're vulnerable, and we know it. And security is incredibly important. And the family structure, the the marriage and family, used to be a source of a real security for women, which has been, um, I won't say it's been lost, but it's certainly been diminished uh, as, as, uh, as family life has declined in this country. And feminism has its, um, it has a role to play, has has some blame. Absolutely. Blame. Absolutely. The decline of family life. And um, so it's, uh, so that's, that's one of the really, um, interesting um, statistics in the book that people are frequently surprised to learn they, that, that women are less happy now than they were 50 years ago. Yeah, it certainly flies in the face of what they, they think they know from what they hear in the media. I'm going to read a quote. I'm going to read a quote from that kind of goes off of what you just said from your book as we close out here in a minute to um, a commercial break. Okay. From, mm-hmm. from increasing income equality to rising levels of adolescent depression and anxiety, from falling male labor participation rates to declining levels of female happiness, the retreat from family life has far-reaching consequences. The institution that feminism assailed as oppressive is looking more like the key to human thriving for both sexes and especially for children. And, of course, what you're talking about there is the traditional family unit, because that is, in fact, exactly what feminism has been attacking for half a century, really. Correct. Um, And and cheerfully and uh, vociferously, they regard the family as a trap for women, as a conspiracy by men to keep women down. Um, And uh, (laughs) this is one of the great ironies of our time, Suzanne. I mean, honestly, you could make the case that marriage was actually a conspiracy (laughs) by women to get men to behave themselves. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. There's no question about that. And that's why divorce, that's one of the reasons divorce has been so um, uh, prolific is because it's been billed as something that's actually liberating to women because, of course, men and babies hold women down and back. That's been the message for years. And you get that in the media in all kinds of ways that sometimes they're benign, like you don't realize how insidious it is because you're not even understanding that you've just been sold a message just in a commercial or let alone a, yeah, a, you right. know, a television uh, program or from a media news report. Well, exactly. And uh, look, I mean, let's not deny that there are bad marriages and that there are unhappy wives out there and unhappy husbands and all of that. That's, of course, true. And as, uh, as the saying goes, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. 
But to acknowledge that there are bad marriages, to acknowledge that divorce is sometimes uh, as a last resort right, can right. be necessary, mm-hmm. um, is, is not to gainsay that the overwhelming data show that married people are happier, healthier, wealthier, um, and, uh, and more well-adjusted on every score. And their children are miles ahead, better off, you know, than the children who come from, from more unstable home situations or home situations that involve just one parent. It's inarguable. And even very left-wing social scientists acknowledge this reality. They may not want to do anything about it in some cases, but they certainly will agree that the best situation for human thriving is a is an intact nuclear family no question and that's a great place to i have to go to commercial break and we'll come right back mona to that topic do you ever wonder what happened to courtship and find yourself longing to go out on a real date do you ask yourself why some marriages last and others fall apart is your marriage struggling despite your best efforts to keep it together women who win at love don't have a gift you don't have what makes them unique is that they aren't at war with the men in their lives rather than take a competitive approach to relationships as the culture teaches they accept that men are men and that women are women and that makes all the difference whether you're single and mapping out your life or you're divorced or unhappily married women who win at love will permanently alter the way you view men in marriage you will learn the eight dating rules that lead to marriage why super successful women struggle in love what men want and what women want hint they're not the same why love alone is not a reason to get married how to avoid the green grass syndrome and why acting like a man lands women in a ditch women who win at love is an in-depth examination of modern dating and marriage and a wake-up call for women at every stage of life so go to amazon.com and type in women who win at love and get ready for your life to change Welcome back to the Suzanne Venker Show. You can find out more at SuzanneVenker.com. That's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com. This program is brought to you by Hair Saloon for Men. At Hair Saloon, customers receive a complimentary hot or cold beverage as well as a shoe shine, hot towel, and mint. At Hair Saloon, they don't offer coupons because they don't need to. Their prices are always reasonable, and customers never feel shortchanged when they walk out the door. So head on over to hairsaloon.com. They have 18 locations in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Boston, and Houston. Book online or through their mobile app. Again, that's hairsaloon.com. We're talking today with Mona Charon about the insidious nature of modern feminism and how it hurts men, women, and families. And we left off, Mona, where we were talking about how it's just... um, indisputable that that children who grow up with a mother and a father in an intact home married mother and father i should say are are light years ahead of of those who do not and while there's exceptions to every rule it's not a reason to to move away from the rule and of course today Correct. yeah and of course today you know single motherhood as we know is at an all-time high and we're not allowed to talk about the obvious problems and effects of that Situation, which which um, in the past was considered something that was, uh, you know, an, an unfortunate situation, and, and certainly people got in it, and you and you helped them and supported them. But it's no longer about an unfortunate situation; it's about being elevated to this place where that's that's something to hail for women, because that's what feminism is ultimately about: is women's not rights, women's needs, and there's no discussion whatsoever of how the children fare with these values and these new values that America is, is upholding. Yeah. So one of the things, I mean, one, I, I'm surprised actually that I didn't get more attacks um, uh, on this book because um, I say some pretty, pretty out there, pretty uh, controversial things. So one of the things, one of the points that I tried to make in the book is that um, this experiment with, um, with single parenthood uh, really occurred first among the African American population in America, where they were the first out the door in terms of marriage. And uh, whereas in the 1950s, you know, a vast majority of African American children grew up with their married parents, by the 1970s it was only a minority. And in the 1960s, when um, when Jim, uh, Patrick Moynihan wrote his famous report on the black family. 
um, the illegitimacy rate at, at the time he, he was raising the alarm about all of these black kids who were growing up without their fathers. And, um, and at the time, and here's the saddest thing, at the time, the rate of illegitimacy among African-Americans was lower Whoa. than it yep. is now yep. among whites. OK, so what happened? They they did. They they they, they took this this experiment and and, uh, and and left marriage behind. And then they started to have all kinds of serious problems with delinquency and drug abuse and crime and other problems. Um, and um, and this ought to have been a canary in a coal mine. But instead, um, the white majority then followed suit. And so uh, whites and Hispanics and all other races and groups and ethnicities have followed this example. And now we have, you know, 40 percent of, uh, of kids and, and actually uh, up to close to 50 percent of American children will spend part of their childhood in a single parent home now. Um, and, um, you know, we now it's so. So at the time when this was happening in the African-American community, there were people who said, well, it's not the decline of marriage that's leading to all of these problems for black Americans. It's, it's slavery, it's discrimination, and that may have been part of it, sure. But, you know, there were also theories about the loss of um, inner city jobs and that this was why there was this huge rise in illegitimacy. And funny, funny thing, um, you know, flash forward 35, 40 years, and what do you see when the white uh, when when many many white Americans are doing the same thing, that is not having not getting married before they have children, we're suddenly hearing that well, it's really the result of deindustrialization, <laughs> the loss of factory jobs, and right. so on and so forth. And you know, actually, um, as I point out in the book, um, if you look at the example of religious Americans who, for because of their religious commitments, believe in marriage and therefore um, don't have children out of wedlock. Now, by the way, there are plenty of religious people who do do mm-hmm. that, and mm-hmm. that's a separate topic. But but I'm just saying, if you look at those people, what do you find? You find that even though they don't have college degrees, and even though they, too, are facing a situation where there is no, there are, the factory jobs have diminished and so on, somehow they manage to be employed. They manage to be prosperous. They're they're not living in poverty. They they are doing just great. And the point is, it's the values that come first. If the value is that you don't have babies out of wedlock, you find a way. You and yeah. your spouse, right. you, know, you find work. And and this idea that it's the it's those those evil factory jobs that is the loss of those factory jobs that's causing all of this social disruption. I just don't think holds up. Well, and nobody knows this better now than what, the problem that we're having with boys and men today who are, by and large, growing up without their fathers. Um, this is true both in black and white communities, but as you say, it's it's bigger in the black community. Uh, still, the issue with men falling behind and women, quote unquote, rising up is really – we're really at the beginning of it, you know, in my opinion. I think this we is are. this is just And Suzanne, you know, when I talk to young people, when I talk to um young women and well, meet women and men, but it's really interesting because I've spoken to many, many student groups about this book. And when I talk about the fact that we tend to measure success for women separately from men, we tend to say, "Wow, isn't it great that women are earning like 60% of the of the BA degrees, the master's uh, d- diplomas in America today. And, um, and I say, well, wait a minute. I mean, yeah, great for the women, but not, uh, but not in the long run, because who are they going to find to marry? Bingo. And Bingo. You would not believe, you would not believe how many of the women, the young women in the audience, their eyes will light up and they'll nod. You know, they are highly aware of this problem. Believe me. <laughs> Do you remember when uh, Tucker Carlson touched on that in January of this year when this monologue? I and do. The, yeah, I do. And, I, I uh, thought Tucker. I thought uh, Tucker had about twenty percent of that dead on. I thought eighty percent of it was a little wrong. But that's another matter for another day. Well, <laughs> he was right about certainly about what you just mentioned is the marriage part, yeah, and, and women that, don't. Yeah, that that's part is true. that's the part I honed yep. in on because, and then he had Heather yep. McDonald on, who who honed in on that as well, which is so yep. important because. When you phrase it that way, when you explain it the way you just said you did with those young women, well, then all of a sudden it puts a different spin on it. You know, you're thinking about this. Oh, it's not just about women rising. What is the outcome of that? What's the result? What does that mean since men and women are at their core? And I want to talk about this 
because we haven't touched upon it yet, but that men and women are drastically different creatures. <laughs> they are not <laughs> the same. They are equal but different, and that is what has gotten lost, Correct. of course, in our feminist world. They want androgyny. Yep. They want interchangeability, and it's not going to they happen. Do. It can't happen, and that's okay no. that it can't happen. It's not supposed to happen. <laughs> Right, exactly. They think that equality has to mean sameness, which is a which is a really juvenile mistake to make, but yet you find it everywhere. And of course, we are equal but different. And uh, you know, the, the, my chapter on the se- differences between the sexes is titled "The Viva La Diferencia." Um, and it doesn't. It shouldn't frighten us. It shouldn't worry us. It's a, it's a great glory of nature. It is, and I actually have a, another paragraph here from your book that, that speaks to this exactly, um, pointing out the difference when you have parents and how that affects men and women. Because everybody feels very equal and the same before kids, and my argument is always that once the kids come along, then everything changes. So you wrote, when our children were young, I felt a burning desire to be at home with them. My husband felt a deep responsibility to provide for all of us. This is common. Marriage and parenthood seem to make women more maternal and men more conscientious earners. Maybe I wanted it this way because I was a latchkey kid before the term was common. Both my parents had PhDs and worked full time. And then you describe your father was a physics and chemistry professor and your mother was a school psychologist. And you said, my childhood was full of lonely hours, home alone. And that to me is so... um, I think there are so many people who can relate to that, certainly products of divorce. And that's not your generation or even mine necessarily, but the current generation who are products of divorce, whether their parents both worked outside the home or whether their parents were divorced, oftentimes the result can be the same in terms of what you just described there is basically being alone. And so yeah. and and yeah. and that, um, you know, that that gets into what we were talking about before and so I need to um, close out one mem- one more minute for a for a commercial break and come back and we'll pick it up there. Are you unhappily single? Does your marriage or relationship feel hard? I get a lot of emails from readers who are struggling in their marriage or relationship. Unfortunately, the help an individual or couple needs can rarely be answered in a series of emails. For this reason, I offer relationship coaching for those who are struggling to find love and for couples whose marriage or relationship feels stuck in a negative cycle. Go to SuzanneBanker.com and sign up today for a coaching session with me and learn the tools you need to find love and sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneBanker.com. Welcome back to The Suzanne Venker Show, where you hear hard-hitting truths the culture hides. Find out more at SuzanneVenker.com. That's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com. This program is brought to you by Hair Saloon for Men. For men against the grain. Visit HairSaloon.com. We're talking today with Mona Charon about the insidious nature of modern feminism and how it hurts men, women, and families. And we left off with a paragraph that I um, had written excuse me, not written, (laughs) read from Mona's book, Sex Matters. And she was talking about having been a latchkey kid and how when she had her children with her husband, she felt a maternal desire there to take care of them and her husband felt a greater need to provide for them and that this is very common and natural. And it's very unfortunate that women cannot feel free to um, respond to that very natural um, and men too, uh, th- thing that wells up inside them when they have children, and that gets into the whole sex roles within marriage that feminists also are very much poo poo if they're traditional in any way. That's right. And yet, when you look at the data, it's just amazing how many women, when they have the choice, yep. that is, you know, their husbands make enough money to permit them to work, like not at all when their kids are young or only part time, women choose over and over and over again to put their families first, to cut back at work, to to um, accept a, a position that makes maybe a little less money, but that provides them more flexibility. Women value that. And that's just one of the signal failures of feminism, not to honor the choices that women freely make. 
Instead, they they um, disparage this and they and they heap shame on it. And they say the only reason you're choosing to cut back at work is because you've been brainwashed yeah. to think you're only good. No, we are not brainwashed. We are intelligent and and thoughtful women who make choices. And I think it was a great gift to be able to be home. I worked from home I, because I'm a writer. I had that I had that luxury when my children were young. But look, I gave up a lot. There's no question. I did cut back at work. I did sort of lean out in mm-hmm. contrast to uh, Sheryl Sandberg's advice. Mm-hmm. Um, there are many opportunities that I forewent. Ne- nevertheless, do I do I regret it? No. I, those were choices freely undertaken. They were for the good of my children. They were for the good of my family. And um, I think in the end, uh, we're all better off for it and uh, for, for feminism to disparage or, or, or um, uh, discourage that is, is completely unhelpful. But by the way, it's, it's so interesting that um, you find among women who are in the upper income uh, uh, mm-hmm. strata, mm-hmm. they're the ones who cut back the most. <laughs> Right. In yes. contrast to what you hear. I mean, that's really interesting. It's kind of in fact, I was talking with a friend in New York City recently and uh, and she was saying that uh, that it is now the case with the with the elite people who whose husbands work on Wall Street. She said, oh, the ultimate luxury good now is a big family. These women have five, six kids. <laughs> Yeah, and they're the only ones, of course, left with that option because regular Americans or blue-collar Americans can't make those same choices based on uh, right. having upset the system from the get-go from the elites. <laughs> that's so right. That's, that's the, exactly right. That's the horrible part of, of it all. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that's always really moved me with my work and bothered me is that I, I want people to understand that what we just described about what most women choose to do is actually the norm. But you don't know that because when you turn on Channel 4 or whatever, you you hear statistics that are always skewed because the vast majority of people that we're hearing from in the media are feminist or feminist-minded individuals or just very liberal or left-wing thinkers. So you're getting all this information filtered through a very biased lens, and it's doing a disservice for the regular people. Well, I, Which I I've won. <laughs> too, but I have to, but I have to say that um, many of the stories and uh, data that I reproduce in the book do come from very mainstream news sites. I mean, they'll run it every now and then. You have to know where to look. But for example, the New York Times upshot column, which follows social trends, um, was actually pretty good on reporting about, for example, and the New York Times Sunday Magazine too about women who choose. Uh, to cut back at work and and how they feel about it and uh, it was uh, pretty interesting. I remember one woman gave a, uh, a told a story about how after her daughter was born, she was you know her daughter was I don't know eleven months old or something and she said I, I drove her to daycare to get ready to go back to the office and I cried the entire way home and she said then I decided this is not right and she turned around and you know made other made other plans so. Yes, they are occasionally in, the in there. New York Times. You're, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> they are occasionally in there. Um, and I wish they were in there more or they were get they got, you know, wider coverage, but at any rate, um, yeah. One of the things and we can look we'll, we need to go out to a commercial break in a second here, so we'll we'll come back to this, but when we come back, I do want to I want to talk about the an underlying a disconnect in feminist ideology, and that's this idea that you're going to empower a group of people, i.e. women, at the same time, you're telling them they're victims. <laughs> I always thought that was right there. How could anybody actually buy that? That doesn't. Those two don't go together. So when we come back from the break, we're gonna we're gonna tackle that one. Welcome back to the Suzanne Venker Show. You can find out more at suzannevenker.com. We're talking today with Mona Charon about the insidious nature of modern feminism and how it hurts men, women, and families. And before we went to break, I mentioned this disconnect in feminist uh, ideology that they're going to be the group that empowers women while they simultaneously insist every single day in a thousand different ways that they're victims, that Hmm. women are victims. Yeah. How does that jive? (laughs) Right. Well, let let me just dwell for a moment on this whole topic of empowerment. Um, 
so first of all, um, I reject the idea that the that power is the be all and end all, particularly in intimate uh, family relationships. I mean, that's the one area of life where you don't want relationships based on power, where you want relationships based on love and and self sacrifice and uh, and tenderness. Um, and yet, the feminists are constantly talking about power, 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 and that how much they want power. Um, but and so that's the first. That's thing. why they're not married. The Sorry. Thing, well, the, the, the <laughs> so many of them. Thing I want to say about <laughs> okay. about power is that there is one particular kind of power that women have always wielded throughout human history, and that's sexual power. The power to withhold sex or to uh, to determine the terms on which they would be sexually available to men. And usually, throughout most of human history, women have exacted a price. They've said, you know, I, just, I know how badly you want to have sex with me, but uh, it requires a certain commitment to me and to my children and to the make into and so forth. And that is exactly the power that feminists stripped away from women. No question. No by question. joining the sexual revolution and saying all of that chastity stuff, you know, we got to get rid of that. And, uh, and it, so here we are. Here we are. <laughs> now. Regarding victimhood, um, I never look. I my life almost tracks exactly with the modern sort of second wave feminism. When uh, I was, uh, I think, three, I was four years old or five years old when uh, Betty Friedan published her famous book, uh, The Feminine Mystique, and um, and so I grew up in an era when feminism was the rage, and um, and I remember right from the get go. I was skeptical about this this narrative that women had always been these, you know, passive victims of powerful men. First of all, I didn't see it in my own family. I came from a long line of strong matriarchs. <laughs> I didn't see it in the history that I read, which was filled with powerful women. I didn't see it in the world around me, where women were, were very assertive and uh, unafraid to exert, you know, to assert themselves. So I, I don't know. I just never, uh, and I, there's a whole section in the book where I talk about all the important women in, in history and the w- women have been behind most of the big social movements in American history for good or ill. And, um, and so I, I just, um, I just never bought this whole, um, victim, uh, narrative. And, um, you know, to be sure, there have always been men who have mistreated women and definitely because men are stronger. And bigger, uh, in general, um, th- there have been occasions where, you know, where men have obviously used that strength in the wrong way, which is why I stress the importance of raising men to be gentlemen, to use their strength for good, not for evil, to protect the weak, not to exploit them, and so forth. Um, but, uh, but I have known just as many in my own life and in my reading and so forth, known just as many examples of women being cruel to men as the opposite and and many many examples of women being unfaithful or being um uh in some way uh, abusive Abusive. to men Mm -hmm. so you know it's 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 not this simple i hate narratives that sort of that, that portray things in black and white terms life is much more complicated than that I couldn't agree more with everything you just said. That's exactly how I view it as well. And, of course, I think the biggest problem with feminism's really revision of history, as I call it, by by selling that idea, is how completely clueless they are about men, really. about They just don't mm-hmm. understand men, really. I mean, and they, of course, they've had, you and I know they also have had very bad histories, a lot of these very outspoken feminists. So they've used those yeah. histories to lash out onto society. And that's really what, what's going on there. But even the women who they've inculcated with their message today just have no understanding of how wrong they are about men. They've got it completely backwards. The average man mm. loves to serve the woman he loves. He's easy as heck to get along with. It's these outliers that get the spotlight that have caused all this hype and this fear. Yes, yes. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, they've done so many disservices, but one of them was convincing women, um, uh, Gloria Steinem was very active in this, but many others have come since, that they had more to fear from 
their husbands or from the boy next door than from a, <laughs> uh, a stranger hiding in the bushes. And uh, or from oh, or in one horrible example that Gloria Steinem me is that the women had more to fear from the boy next door than from the women in in, in wartime situations. Well, good God! Oh I think the the average man is not a rapist and not hostile to women and not even a, a brute. I mean, the right. average man is a nice guy. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And that's yeah. when we come back from this last break. Um, I want to pick up there where this difference between femininity and masculinity and what's happened today, because we know we hear this horrible phrase, toxic masculinity. And mm. really, really, my argument has always been that feminists, ultimately, their real beef is with femininity. It's not even with men. And I'm, we'll come back to that after mm. the break. You're a man that respects quality over quantity. You value relationships that can stand the test of time. You enjoy convenience without sacrificing comfort. At Hair Saloon for Men, we get it. We are restoring the time-honored tradition of delivering a haircut experience men across all generations can depend on. Because sometimes the man everyone depends on needs a place of his own to depend on. The experience goes well beyond the haircut. With every perfect haircut service, you receive a complimentary beverage, a relaxing shampoo, a hot towel and mint for the perfect finish, and remember to take advantage of the complimentary shoe shines. While today's world is filled with numerous clip joints and fancy salons, Hair Saloon is building something better, something different. Book appointments online 24-7, and walk-ins are always welcome. Hair Saloon, for men against the grain. Visit hairsaloon.com to find a saloon in your neighborhood or for franchising opportunities. That's hairsaloon.com. Welcome back to the Suzanne Venker Show. You can find out more at SuzanneVenker.com. We're talking today with Mona Charon about her book, Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense. And we left off talking about masculinity and femininity and how um, I've always believed that feminists' real beef is with femininity because they saw and they see that role as very different than it really is. They view it as less than. And because of that, well, of course you're always going to try and be competitive with men or go after the power, Mona, that, you're always, that you were talking about in the workforce because you believe that this other role is lesser than. Well, if you don't believe that, of course, you don't need to compete with men because you know that that isn't accurate. Can you Do you agree with that? Um. So I, I do uh, I do to a degree. Look, there are situations where women do need to compete with men in the workplace. Um, you know, if you're vying oh, for the same yeah, job yeah. or whatever, you know, in those situations. But I I, I was I, thinking I, more I, relationships. I grander, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah Love yeah. relationships. And, and, yeah. And, and, and pulling pulling the the lens back a bit, I I do think you're absolutely right when you say that they are uncomfortable with femininity and they feel that femininity is inferior to masculinity because if you look at the reforms and the um uh the, the policy preferences of women uh, uh, feminists it's always to model their lives on on men rather than to make the world more comfortable for women right and i, I don't think that they, they as you said earlier they didn't understand men now we're saying they don't really understand women either mm-hmm. uh, and what women truly want um, women want they want commitment from their men mm-hmm. they want security uh they want children for the most part so the men by the way um and uh and they want to be able to make choices freely without being told that somehow when they choose, say, I mean, it's by the way, it's fine with me if women don't want families and want to, mm-hmm. you know, pursue careers. At, you know, great. That's it's a free country. That's wonderful, right? But the, but what I'm saying is, the overwhelming majority of women do want families and do want to uh, prioritize their family, mm-hmm. prioritize mm-hmm. their families when their kids are young. And see, as long and, as they do that. Feminists are never going to get. They will. Uh, no, exactly because women. Are, you know, there's no question that when women prioritize family life when their kids are young, they don't make the gains in the workforce that men make. Right. They don't make as much money, and so on and so forth. Well, so what? 
they are getting something very precious. And I think some men even envy women the ability to, um, you know, cut back mm-hmm. and, and be, be, you know, be the, the center of life in the home. I mean, it is a, it is, I, it's one, of, look, I've had a very happy career and I wouldn't have traded it and it's terrific, but the joy and delight of being a mother was far beyond the joy of my career. And I think most women who have been mothers feel that way. Well, that's just a great place that, to end it. This has been a great conversation, Mona. Where can people find out more Thanks, about yeah. your work? Uh, they can find me at uh, monacharan.com or they can find uh, my columns at nationalreview.com and or they're also at my website and uh, or at, on Twitter at Mona Charon, EPPC, which is for Ethics and Public Policy Center, where I'm a senior fellow. So once again, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Mona Charon, EPPC. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Mona. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Suzanne. I really enjoyed it. Hope to talk to you soon. Well, that wraps up another edition of The Suzanne Venker Show. If you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, and please take one minute to give us your review. If you have a comment or question, email Suzanne at the thesuzannevenkershow.com. Finally, don't forget to check out SuzanneVenker.com, where you can download three free ebooks that help women succeed with men in life and in love. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend. Hair Saloon, it's more than just a haircut. You walk in the door, tired, spent, looking a bit ragged. You're greeted by a warm welcome like you've been here before. A complimentary drink slides across the bar, quenching your thirst for comfort and convenience. The sound of clippers and conversation can be heard drowning out the noise of the world. You sit comfortably, surrounded in soft leather and smooth chrome. The smell of oak and clubman talc reconnects you to traditions your father and grandfather once knew. The soothing sounds of sharp metal trim away at your problems. Staying put in a comfortable barber chair, you lay back, resting your eyes as warm water and sweet mint soap washes away your worries. You recapture a few minutes to feel strong again, to look your best, and to get ready for what's next. And you're ready to repeat again a few weeks later. Hair Saloon, for men against the grain. Visit hairsaloon.com to find a location near you. That's hairsaloon.com.